Welcome back. It's Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm David Leitner. I'm your instructor. And today, um, why are primates social? This is a common feature of all primates, uh, something that we share, something called sociality, that is this ability to live in relative harmony with one another. Um, but why do we do it? What's it good for? Um, wouldn't it make more sense if uh, natural selection is all about sort of re individual reproductive fitness that we should just, I don't know, just look out for ourselves? Well, today we're going to kind of jump into some of those reasons. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to sociality. So, one thing that all mammals share is that they tend to have longer developmental periods than other animals. Um, that is the time we spend as children or pre-adults, uh, pre-sexual maturity is longer than in a lot of other kinds of organism. Um, primates take this to the extreme, in fact, uh, and Let's take a look at why. You can see this here, actually. You've got several different um, representatives of the order um, primata. And you can see the various ages at which um, we... The length of gestation, amount of time spent as infants, juveniles, adults, and the period of time during which reproductive maturity occurs and the first reproduction is typically occurs. Um, you can see that um, while the longest period for all of these is adulthood and that period of sexual maturity, you'll notice that in each of them, uh, however, as we, especially in humans and many of the apes, a significant portion of time is spent uh, after birth in either infancy or juvenile period. Um, why is that? That seems really strange. Well, let's take a look at some other things we know about primates. Typical, um, uh, typical litters, as it were, for primates are single offspring. Twins happen, but there are very few exceptions to this rule. Marmosets and tamarins typically have twins, uh, and sometimes more, but, but by and large, single offspring is the rule in primates. That's a lot less than most other, um, well, I won't say most, but a lot of other uh, mammals. Um, let's take a look at that. That means if you only have one offspring and they have this extended period of, of maturing, um, that's a bit unusual. Most mammals have larger litters, but invest very little time and energy in parenting compared to primates. Um, and the idea there is kind of a shotgun approach. We don't want to put too much time and investment in one because some of them are going to die. And let's just focus on the ones that survive. Okay. Primates instead say, we're going to ensure this one doesn't die by putting as much effort as we can into it. So they increase the chance of each individual offspring's uh, survival um, at the cost of having more, uh, having fewer offspring overall. Um, it's a trade-off, okay? Uh, in evolutionary terms, one of, the, one of the issues is that you're going to have fewer generations and fewer... Uh, fewer births as a whole in the species over the same period of time uh, if you take this approach. On the other hand, you're going to have a lot more survival and you're going to ensure that those genes uh, have a much better chance of surviving to the next generation. Put this together with another known fact about primates is we tend to be highly encephalized. That is, we have much larger brains for our body mass than is typical in most mammals. Um, and you get this little equation. You got big brains, high maternal investment, extended period of development. And this all comes together for one thing. 
primates have to be socialized. Offspring have to learn outside of the womb. They aren't born with all of their instincts intact. Uh, and that's especially true in humans. Look at how long we spend in juvenile and infancy periods. You know, it can be 15 to 20 years or more, depending on, you know, when you become financially independent, I guess. But even biologically speaking, you know, we're talking about 12 to 15 years before sexual maturity. That's a long time. And we have especially long interbirth uh, intervals as well, typically around 18 to 24 months. Uh, between children. Obviously, there's a great deal of variation there, but that's what it sort of averages out to. Um, so, yeah, this is, a, this is a difference between primates and a lot of other mammals, is most of our behavior is learned. Um, and like I say, humans take this to an even further extent. Okay, so our behavior is learned. It's not all in our genes. Okay, the brains have to finish forming by interacting with the environment and most importantly with other members of our species. You can't, you could, if you raise a child without any, I, I, this is, doesn't have to be a human child, any primate child without any exposure to others of its kind, it will have very serious developmental problems in terms of cognitive development, in terms of, of mental health. Um, it's not a good situation. That's not what we're built for. Um, <clears throat> and primates as a whole exhibit more social complexity than most other mammals as well. So that social complexity is what we're spending most of our time learning how to interact with others of our kind, how to judge their moods and their motivations, how to communicate with them, how to get what we need and also offer what they need at the same time. These are very complicated, cognitively very complicated things. Uh, and all in the service of having these bigger brains. But here's the thing. We have big brains, right? Um, and... That's true of all primates. We show a greater degree of encephalization, and especially in the ne neocortex. That's the cerebrum, which is especially in areas associated with higher cognitive functions, executive function, that sort of thing. Um, in humans especially, we have a much larger surface area through the inclusion of many, many ridges and valleys. Um, but um, brains are a weird, Big brains are a weird, weird adaptation because they actually aren't that obvious on the surface as a positive thing. Um, they're extremely metabolically expensive. They make up about 2% of your body mass and anywhere from 16 to 20% of your energy consumption. They are expensive, expensive organs um, in humans. And it's a little less so in other primates, but it's still pretty expensive. Um, they take so long to develop, and it has to be done outside of the womb, because if the brains reach full capacity inside the womb, the head's too big to come out. So, um, the advantage to survival of having big brains has to be a huge one, right? It has to be very, very big. And... That's where sociality comes in. Most primates live in groups with high degrees of social complexity. Group sizes and organization varies, and sociality is the fundamental adaptation that allows us to do that. But why sociality? There's a paradox when it comes to sociality. Um, why on earth, if... Natural selection's sort of goal is individual reproductive success. Why would you possibly potentially put that at risk by working together with others? What's the benefit? Well, three main benefits come out. Access to mates, access to foods, 
and avoiding predators. And let me point out, there are other ways to do all three of these things, okay? But it's just a different strategy. Okay, access to mates. Group life provides access to more mates. You don't have to go out trying to find as many. Uh, but it also means you've, you're in more competition for mates as well, whether both male and female. Um, competition means more energy expense. So there's sort of a trade-off here. Um, interestingly, how a society organizes it's males and females, therefore, matters, because that will sort of change the amount of energy spent and the rewards for, ending, for spending that energy. The intensity of competition, plus the importance of females' role in mate choice, leads to levels of sexual dimorphism in most primates. Uh, th we are moderately sexually dimorphic, that is... On average, males tend to be larger, have more hair, more body hair, more facial hair, uh, and a few other traits than women do, than females do. Like I say, it's on average. There's a great deal of overlap there in our own species, which is why we're only moderately sexually dimorphic. Um, but other species where mate competition is much higher, usually in, in species where mating strategies aren't monogamous, uh, largely. And I should point out, too, mating strategies in humans are, it gets into a whole nother sort of uh, uh, level of complexity, because we don't have just one mating strategy. Every culture has its own, and they involve things that have nothing to do with the things that um, that other primates are worried about, okay? But for other primates, generally, a lot of competition for mates means much more sexual dimorphism. Uh, low competition, therefore, sort of monogamous societies will tend to, like these owl monkeys at the bottom here, will tend to have low levels of sexual dimorphism. You can see the mountain gorilla at the top here, the male, much more robust, uh, much higher crest and larger crest on his head, as well as more robust features like the brow and the jaw in general. If he opened his mouth, he'd know that he has much larger canines than the female uh, and has a much larger body mass overall. Mountain gorillas are uh, generally one male polygynous societies. That is, there's one male and many females. And the male, other males are constantly threatening his position so that they can be the one male. And that leads to this sexual dimorphism. Now, access to food is a little clearer. There is, there is a benefit in exploiting the food-finding abilities of others to offset, um, to offset the chances you might not be able to find all the food you need yourself. The Trade-off is then once somebody finds the food, everybody finds the food, right? Uh, but females uh, often stay linked in matrilineal groups uh, when they're looking for food in primates because those, uh, those ties make it more likely for them to share the food with one another. And so when sharing occurs... Uh, it actually benefits everybody because if I don't find enough food for myself today, but you give me some of yours, I'll remember that tomorrow and maybe do the same. It's called reciprocity. Um, it also involves us finding food resources that we can't collect entirely ourselves that are more abundant than we can uh, exploit effectively and prevents food wastage as a result. Um, it also leads to sharing food collecting strategies. This is a learned behavior. This chimpanzee is fishing for termites in the in the recesses of this tree trunk using a twig. The twig excites the termites. Termites latch onto it. He pulls them out. Mm, eats them off the stick. It's like a like a carnival tree, like a like corn on the uh, 
uh, not corner the dog, uh, like a corn dog. <laughs> uh, similar here. Uh, nut opening behaviors using simple tools like this are shared among members of a group. In fact, actually, we often see evidence of cultural variation from one group to the next as it spreads. Um, the final sort of obvious thing is protection from predators. There's very little indirect evidence for this. Sorry, there's little, little direct evidence, but the indirect evidence is pretty convincing. Um, alarm calls. Okay, um, uh, they are the most obvious sort of example of this. Uh, but there's another, you know, so like if one pr more eyes on the sky means more chances to see that eagle coming down to get you. Uh, but uh, in addition, in a large group, you lessen the chance that the predator is zoning in on you specifically. I mean, that sounds a little Machiavellian, but like, you know, hey, there's a better chance he's going for your neighbor than for you, um, or one of your neighbors than for you. So um, I should also point out wide variety of predators in this context. Obviously, typical ones for a lot of primates are things like felines, uh, some reptiles, uh, birds of prey for sure. Uh, humans, I think we can't leave out, but also other primates other than humans as well. Chimpanzees are known to uh, hunt red colobus monkeys. Okay, well, okay, so those are some of the benefits. How does this behavior even start in the first place? Like, where does it come from? Um, key to sociality is this notion of altruism, that is... An individual will engage in behavior that may be costly to their own reproductive, reproductive success, but will benefit the others. Why would somebody do that if natural selection is about your personal reproductive success? Well, there's a good reason. Look at this prairie dog here. He's signaling that he's seen something. He's telling everybody, hey, there's something in the area. When he does that, I assume it's a he. It might be a she. Um, when they do that, they are making themselves a target for whatever potential danger that is. They are drawing attention to themselves and away from everybody else. It gives everybody else a chance to escape at the cost of upping their chance of getting caught. This is an idea called inclusive fitness. That is that Instead of looking at fitness as just your personal reproductive fitness, we have to look at fitness in terms of the combination of your reproductive fitness and the fitness of everybody around you. And we have to look at this from the perspective of the gene that is behind this behavior, the gene that makes this behavior likely to happen. Because this behavior will not get passed down if it doesn't have some advantage. And so from the genes perspective, people you're related, people in your group may also have this gene. And so you will behave in ways that protect them. When it is directly linked to the degree of relatedness to another individual in the group, um, we call that kin selection. This is the tendency that animals will be more likely to act altruistically to close kin than they will to distant kin or unrelated uh, individuals. Um, this is, again, from the perspective of the gene that is leading to the altruistic behavior, this is a great idea because if I make sure, you know, my sister or my child has 50% has a 50-50 chance of also having this gene, right? Assuming we only inherited from one of our parents, right? Uh, then me and my sibling, or if I have it, there's a 50-50 chance my child has it, right? From that perspective, if I can't save myself, I better save somebody else. It's, it's somebody who's likely to have the gene. And that is why there is... Um, that is why 
the clo more closely related an individual is, the more likely they are to act altruistically. We think this is the origin of this altruistic behavior and why it is an, uh, a reproductive advantage. But only when you look at it from the perspective of the gene and from the perspective inclusive, of inclusive fitness, that my fitness can include the fitness of others. Now, the scientists who came up with this, uh, Hamilton, uh, developed an equation to sort of calculate this. He's a mathematician, actually, and he said, like, let's describe this mathematically. And so he said the degree, uh, the coefficient of relatedness would be the degree of relatedness, R, that is the likelihood that we both share this gene for altruism, multiplied by the benefit to the recipient of the altruism, has to be greater than the cost of the altruism to the person giving the uh, giving to the beneficiary in order for it to happen. To give you a better example here, um, let's say the donor is a parent, the recipient's a child. In that case, R would be one half, 50%, right? There's a 50% chance that the gene, the altruism gene in the parent has been passed to the child. Um, the benefit, let's say the benefit to the child of giving this child, um, this food, say the food was scarce. You're giving the child your last piece of food. Well, maybe that results in them potentially having three more offspring later on, but it's going to cost you potentially one offspring in the future. Well, then the benefit is three. And the cost is one. So if we plug in the equation, one half times three, that is one half is 50% likelihood that you, you share the gene. Three is the benefit to the recipient, uh, is greater than one. That is 1 1.5 is greater than one. Since 1 1.5 is in fact greater to one, altruism happens. Now, if this had been, if the benefit had only been one, well, then the likelihood wouldn't have been very great, and the likelihood of altruism happening would have dropped. Now, we call these this levels of selection because we can't just look at the selective advantage, the reproductive advantage, from the perspective of your individual fitness. We have to look at it from the fit perspective of the fitness of those around you as well. This has been a powerful factor in the evolution of primates as a whole, and especially in humans. It is... It has made possible the evolution of complex social systems, the possibility of cooperation and of politics, and also, unfortunately, of wars as well. Um, but it is key to the complexity of our own human sociality. It is rooted, and that sociality is rooted in our shared evolutionary history with other primates. We just need to hope they don't learn to cooperate as well as we do. Until next time, hope you have a great week and you're taking care of yourself, and I'll see you soon. Bye.